an echo. And we're live. I gotta I gotta turn off my settings here because. But we're having some technical difficulties. <laughs> I mean, when aren't we though? <laughs> Meh. <laughs> If we waited for things to be perfect, we would never have important conversations. Yeah, I think I'm going to put my headphones on. Yeah, I would. I think this helps if you if you have the ability to do it. So everyone, uh, we are having little technical difficulties, but I am at Dr. Simon. Welcome to hashtag SPSM. If you're on Twitter, uh, you'll be seeing in the next minute or two uh, a stream of welcome messages. Of course, you can always call the National Suicide Prevention Crisis Line, or you can chat at crisischat.org should you need someone to talk to. Um, I think our community does a great job of keeping safe while we talk about these difficult topics. Tonight is no exception. Um, we have a sad occasion that we're going to be discussing. We're going to be discussing the death of Leela Alcorn. Uh, and if you would please, as you're looking in the Twitter feed, uh, and in the links below YouTube, I will put a link to the blog with, with all the sort of back information for tonight's discussion. But we have uh, a wonderful panel here tonight to discuss several complex suicide prevention and social media uh, issues related to the death of Leela Alcorn, who is a transgender youth. And um, if, if you are like me, you may have had the TV off too much during the holidays. But luckily, because of social media, I, I collaborate with wonderful folks. I'm going to introduce um, my co-moderator and the folks on our panel who definitely brought this issue to my attention so that we could talk about it more and improve our community's wisdom. So I'm going to start with Dr. Bart Andrews. Hey, what's going on? Welcome uh, uh, to everybody that's out there. I'm so excited. And I'm, I was really pleased, April, um, to hear that uh, when Desiree brought this idea to you that you just shook everything up and said let's do this because it's so important. I think that says a lot about you and about SPSM and I'm really glad to be here. Yeah. Uh, and, and what do you do, Bart, just for everybody's benefit? That's a really good question. People ask me that all the time. Uh, my <laughs> boss has been asking me that. And um, my answers to date have been I show up and um, at a certain point I leave. No, I'm, a, um, I'm the Vice President of Clinical Operations at Behavioral Health Response. Um, we're a large um, crisis agency in St. Louis, Missouri. We do all kinds of different stuff. But, but suicide prevention, crisis intervention work is, is really um, our, our primary purpose. Um, we really are in the business of, of saving lives and helping people stay safe. And, uh, and so being a part of SPSM is a big part of that. And my boss loves that I'm involved with this. And, and April, thank you for getting me involved in this. When I met you at NASCOD and found out about this, um, it's just been the coolest thing since sliced bread. And sliced bread's pretty cool. Also, for any of you, uh, and just really quickly, if you have been following the hashtag SPSM after project clearance in December, Dr. Byard Andrews has become the, the memorator and has been the generator <laughs> of many suicide prevention squirrel memes that are great and will knock your socks off. You need to check them out. Uh, next, I am super thrilled. Um, one of the great things about SPSM and our, our relationship with AAS is our ability to use our network to bring really quality guest experts. And so tonight, we have Dr. Ryland Testa with us, uh, and I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. Yeah, I was thrilled when you guys contacted um, me as well. Um, this is the work that I focus on. I've been, I'm a health psychologist. I'm mainly a faculty member right now. A clinical psychology is my training. And um, I've been working on issues, all sorts of self-destructive behaviors um, is my focus of research. I find it both... Um, interesting that that this is one of the primary causes of mortality in our country. Things like suicide, things like um, overeating and smoking, things that we know aren't good for ourselves. And of course, suicide is the issue that I'm most passionate about. And um, it strikes me as a transgender person seeing the level the 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 level that these issues are present in the transgender community. And so my research has focused on that over the past several years. And this is a tremendous opportunity um, brought to us by tragic circumstances. But I hope a moment that we can utilize to improve our understanding of what's driving the high rates of suicide in this population um, and help us better our prevention. So thank you guys so much for taking this on, and thanks for inviting me to be here. 
Uh, we are super thrilled that you are here with us tonight, especially because you bring a layer of academic expertise and lived experience to this, and we, we value very much the marriage of those things together. Um, our next uh, panelist I'm really excited about, she's been a member of our SPSM community for a while. This is her first hangout, but I will say that when I said who should be on the panel, several people independently mentioned her name right off the bat, and she was like, I'm in. Uh, so everybody, it's Sabrina Strong. Hi. Can Tell you hear me? Yourself. We can. <laughs> All right, can you, can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. All right, excellent. So we're having some technical difficulties, so I'm going to do the best that I can. So hi, everybody. <laughs> so my name is Sabrina Strong. I'm the executive director of an organization called Waking Up Alive, which provides suicide prevention services throughout the state of New Mexico. Um, we also administer the New Mexico Suicide Prevention Coalition. And I've been personally doing a lot of work with the National Action Alliance and their Suicide Attempt Survivors Group. And um, we've just started working as an organization. We started part partnering with the Transgender Resource Center of New Mexico here um, because that, that really is where we're seeing the highest risk. That's, that's our highest risk group, and that's where we want to start to figure out what we can do to make that better because we have a good peer support network that we can utilize to kind of push information out to people because that's really where people are going to their peers to get this kind of support. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of the reasons that we're really excited that you're here, Sabrina, is that you have been actively talking with folks who are familiar with the transgender community and also social media and about this event. And so mm -hmm. you have some very practical feedback on sort of how these services play out, what the user experience is like for the support yes. services that we're trying to recommend for. Yeah. And thank you so much. And finally, uh, everybody, uh, one of my <laughs> one of my favorite collaborators, uh, because God only knows what she's gonna do next. And usually people say <laughs> that about me. Everybody says her stage to live through this. Why don't you introduce yourself, Des? Oh, what do I even say? Um, <laughs> I'm Desiree Sage. Um, I am a photographer in Brooklyn. I guess I'm a writer too these days. Um, I am the the main thing I focus on is a project called Live Through This, which is a, a portrait and oral history series on suicide attempt survivors. So that's my baby. That's what I do. I've interviewed 112 suicide attempt survivors across the United States at this point. And photograph them and schlepped your behind everywhere to make sure that the project and the stories have got seen and talked with the New York Times and done a lot of the heavy lifting with media work and appeared on Glenn Beck and now you're fancy in all these magazines and we're very grateful for your media expertise, Des. Glenn Beck and I are BFFs. I, I, I like, was never a Glenn Beck fan before August. Like, way to go. Uh, Glenn, if you're watching, like, God damn it, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, so everybody also, if you're watching uh, in our Twitterverse, please do take a minute to introduce yourself on Twitter. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, at ADWWW, Mr. Tony Wood. If you need to get messages to us, please tweet to him or get to at uh, Fought for Hope, which is our dear uh, Sam Nads, or at Torlin Swirl, or even at Amelia Atos84. Please to get us messages so that we can respond to your content. It, as you've seen, these events have become more complex. It's been more of a challenge for us to do this smoothly, but I think we've got a good And uh, I am going to see if maybe, Des, could you start by, while I uh, pass it to the feed, by explaining how we shifted gears. That's a different plan. But why we decided to do Oh, I've got such an echo on you. What? Yeah. She wanted you to explain why we decided to do this. Oh, so we decided to do this because I guess it was, was it last Monday or the Monday before last, I, I got a Google alert on um, Leela Alcorn and I, I found the story and I looked it up and I, I saw that there was no coverage on it. There was maybe one coverage on a blog that was not um, local media in Ohio. And when I looked at the local media in Ohio, all I found was uh, about eight syndicated articles on the fact that Ryan Joshua Alcorn had died uh, by being hit by a, a truck in, on a highway. 
And there was one blog that, that told the real story that had found, um, I guess, Leela's Tumblr and, and, and told the story. And I was like, wow, this is really awful. How, how come nobody is saying anything? Where, where is everybody? And I had this very real fear that, that no one was going to no one was going to jump on this and, and really use it as a teachable moment because that is what Leela wanted. That is very clear. Um, and so I wrote something and I continued to like watch them. The way that I saw it um, kind of play out was not not what I had expected and not what I had hoped for. So um, we're dealing with a little technical difficulty with Echo, so we're going to take just a quick pause. If uh, who, am, who am I, folks, is wearing a mic today? Uh, I'm wearing one. I'm I've tried pulling it and restarting it. And I'm also right. going to try lowering my audio. Yeah, I got my audio really low now. Does that help at all? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to try lowering our audio to maybe get the feedback very quickly before we move on. But I, I see that we've started the introductions on SPSM. I think we're 10 minutes in and we've got like 50 or 60 tweets already. Awesome. All right, we're at question one, so I'm going to propose this to the panel, and Bart, if you can help uh, the, get the conversation going while I manage some of the panel. Question sure. one, in the aftermath of Lou Alcorn's death by suicide, we're hearing a lot about suicide risks to transgendered folks. What is driving that? And I'm going to put Dr. Tess on, because I really would love for you to talk a little bit about risk-specific factors for the transgender community. Yeah, so, I mean, the research is very much in the beginning stages on this issue. It's really, I think we're catching the wave right now of society beginning to understand what transgender means and beginning to take a new look at what's been going on for this population. So, you know, everything that I'm going to talk about we really are in the beginning stages of understanding. Um, what I have been doing is piecing together Tom Joyner's model of, in, of the interpersonal theory of suicide, um, which talks about just across the board for all people, really important um, risk factors being thwarted belongingness and perceived burdensomeness. And I've been linking that theory with my understanding of the minority stress theory, um, which was originally developed for LGB, lesbian, gay, bisexual people um, by Alain Meyer. And minority stress theory talks about both distal stressors um, that minority people may face and then um, internal or proximal stressors. And what I've been trying to show in my research, which has been uh, coming to light, is that these minority stress factors are very much related to the interpersonal factors. Um, so I put out there... Um, and maybe Tony or somebody can help me figure out where to direct people so that they can see actually a list of the minority stress factors. I created a, a scale, uh, a measure that people, if there's any clinicians out there and they want to see what risk factors their clients might be facing, you can give somebody this measure. But um, to go over briefly, what are these minority stressors that transgender people are facing um, that may be uh, explaining the suicidality, the distal stressors are things that most people are probably aware of. The rejection that people can face from from peers, from family, as we saw in this case, um, and victimization. Uh, transgender people are, unfortunately, many of them have experienced trauma, violence, um, verbal and physical. Um, from all sorts of people, from family members and also from complete strangers on the street. Um, so there's, there's rejection, there's victimization, um, there's discrimination, like job employment discrimination. So all of these stressors can um, lead to mental health disparities and including suicidality. That was a part of the, the LGB general model. What I have seen as an additional stressor for transgender people is the idea of non-affirmation. Um, so when I say non-affirmation, I'm talking about somebody's gender identity. So as you can imagine, um, if 
if somebody is still appearing to the world as the gender that they were assigned as, as birth, their sex, um, they're going to be misgendered, as we would say all the time. So a trans woman who is on the phone and is getting the, no, thank you, sir. Okay, that's one that there's no ill intention there, but it can still hurt and it can still um, make somebody feel like there's this layer between themselves and the world. So this is an additional stressor, this whole idea of non-affirmation. That was a very sort of tranquil example of it, but non-affirmation can be a lot more hurtful when it's somebody like a family member or friends refusing to use the pronouns that you feel are appropriate um, or the name. And I think the non-affirmation piece of stress also ties into something that we should probably talk more about later on in terms of do people have access to medical care? Because for some people, um, depending on your physiology, they may need um, that they may need medical intervention in order to be able to present to the world in a way that feels consistent um, for them. Um, so there's all of those distal stressors coming from the outside world, but then all of those distal stressors, as you can imagine, have an impact on how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about the world. So the um, proximal stressors would be things like internalized transphobia, so if, if a person starts believing all of those negative stigma that they see in the world, um, they've internalized those ideas that maybe nobody's going to love me, or maybe I'm worthless, or maybe I'm disgusting. Um, and as you can imagine, that doesn't do so well for mental health. Um, you can also begin to have negative expectations about future events. So if people have rejected me in the past, or if I see on TV that every transgender person um, has to go into sex work because they get um, discrimination all the time for jobs, then I may just have negative expectations about how my life is going to turn out. Um, and then the final piece is concealment. So it's just stressful if anybody has carried around sort of some information that they feel they can't share with other people. That can be a stress. And if you can imagine um, having to conceal parts of yourself, like primary parts of yourself, that can be really stressful and can, again, lead to mental health outcomes like anxiety, um, depression, which we know are related to suicide. So I think, you know, that that's a long list of reasons that it makes a lot of sense why transgender people may have um, some mental health disparities and may um, uh, that may include suicidality. Yeah. Okay, that was wonderful. Um, just so that you know, there is a ton of conversation happening on Twitter. I can barely keep up with it, so I've missed some of the things that Dr. Testa said. Bart, can you help direct the commentary for the panel? Yeah, so I, I, I think that what, what you just said was so amazingly wise. And, and one, one of the things that's really become clear to me is this. We talk about ableism, we talk about racism, and, and the concept of normalism. That, that in fact, that, that for those of us that are different, that are different from traditional society, there is a power behind discrimination and prejudice. It's not, it's not just discrimination and prejudice, because that occurs for everybody in varying degrees, but there's a power behind it. And for people who are um, struggling with identity, um, transgender, questioning, and who are starting to find themselves, as they're coming forward, their difference, how they're different from the, the quote unquote normals, becomes more obvious. So in that period of time, as, as those of you who've come out, disclosed, and whatever it is, you know how vulnerable that is. And to, to come out and to be rejected in such a strong way um, can be so damaging. Um, and, and I think that's really what we're all struggling with here is that the pain of here's someone's kind of, they're coming to, they're, they're, they're really going through this beautiful metamorphosis. They're really growing into themselves. And in that process, they're rejected outright uh, by people who have power over them, right? So I, I think it's even particularly more challenging for a minor who can't make their own choices, right? They, she, you know, um, she could not um, make the choices and wasn't empowered to do the things that she needed to do. Uh, and that's that's normalism. People were discriminating against her and prejudiced against her and they had power over her. Sabrina, what do you have to say about this? I know that you have been listening to a lot of commentary about this topic. 
Yeah, and it's there are a lot of pieces kind of all over the place. Um, I, but I was, you know, nodding along because the these are some of the same conversations that we have at the Transgender Resource Center. Of it, it's not just it, it's the constant every day. There is a certain level of stress that people are dealing with every day, and and even out on the street trying to figure out is this person going to attack me? Are they? You know, we. We have a lot of folks who that we work with who are currently experiencing homelessness. So they're trying to find a safe place to sleep in their car. They might have to sleep outside. And a lot of people will come back to us and report that um, they, you know, they've been assaulted multiple times physically and sexually because they look different. And that's the, the hard part. You can't keep people safe. and some people might not have anybody, but then you talk to some folks and you realize they have family members who just refuse to take them back. And they might not even give a reason. And then you're kind of handed this as the helper and kind of say, okay, well, what, do I do? what do I do with this? Um, and so one of the things that we talk about a lot is family of choice. Because a lot of people might end up being rejected by everybody in their life, but they they have a group of people, and that's you know through a whole variety of ways. Um, actually, coming to the center, coming to a support group. So the Transgender Resource Center in New Mexico offers at least a half a dozen support groups that I can think of off the top of my head. And we're actually talking about adding a, um, like a, a suicidality support group because people are so excited by this idea because they're struggling with this. A lot of them have 18, 19, 22, 23 suicide attempts. And so this is, again, it's, this is the risk that we know about after looking at the literature, but it's turned up so much more. Um, so when we, you know, it's not just the, the support groups, but just the one-on-one, -on -one, like people find somebody they can connect to. There's, I mean, huge outreach. Obviously, social media is huge. And there's so many people who just keep finding folks on social media that they know are trans, that they have somebody to talk to. And a lot of teenagers actually will reach out. This is why I love the, this hashtag that was going around for a little while called Real Life Trans Adult. Mm -hmm. And if you hadn't seen it before, it was it basically to let young people know that you can be a real life trans adult and be successful and be happy and have a family and have all the things that you know, maybe you think in your head you know, we were talking about that idea that people internalize what they can't have, um, or what they shouldn't be or what they can't be. And so those are huge things. You know, we've talked about the idea of, of you know, providing a formal mentorship program because mentoring is really important. And not just having a transgender mentor for a young person, but a cisgender mentor. And for people who aren't really familiar with those terms, uh, you know, trans transgender just means I switched from from the gender I was assigned at birth to a different gender. Um, and cisgender means, you know, I was assigned, me personally, I was assigned female at birth, so I'm still a female. And then, you know, that continues to be the, you know, uh, there is no change, there is no movement. Um, that's how I continue to identify. And that, that has come up a lot as a topic that having um, cisgender allies basically who can do some of this work and will say, you know, hey, stop it. <laughs> because, you know, we're seeing all of these things out here. This is one of the reasons why we got this chat together tonight. But also to, to kind of give people some models as to what it means because they're changing now from the gender that they were born into. And we don't know what their models were for being men or women or if they, you know, um, even if they decide to identify as gender queer, which is a, a you know, or gender neutral, which is something that you know folks just will tell you, and we that's that's how we actually introduce each other. We say, yeah, you know, I give my name, I say who I am, and, you know, I'm just volunteer staff here. We ask somebody what name they want to be called and what their gender pronouns are, and that way we know what what they want to be called, and that's one of the things we make that space for people. And so, you know, providing that that kind of that space for people to get a sense of how basically how to be transgender, but how to be whatever comfortable in whatever gender they choose to identify with. Because that's, we don't know what people's models were. 
and you know I see a lot of this with because I work mostly with trans women and they've now fallen into the same thing that we've all grown up with which is this is what it's supposed to be you know this is what it means to be a woman and I say no we've we've been fighting against this forever it does not mean it means you can be you can look exactly how you want to look you wear your wear hair how you want to wear it you wear makeup if you want to you dress how you want to use whatever name you want um, and those those are things that are important so those are kind of just to draw out a few ideas about you know how we try to how we try to use our interactions to be positive and I mean a lot of it if, as a professional for those of you who are in the professional field this is a specialty and if you don't spend time working with the trans community you're not going to get it and you might not be accepted so for example you know all, all the ther we, we don't have very many mental health providers uh, in oh. our area at all but there are two that are approved to do gender counseling by by the community they might claim that they do it, but there are only two that have a reputation that we trust because of the reports that we've gotten back. And so this is, when we talk about lack of resources, this is what we mean. Whatever, everybody can complain about how many things they don't have in their community, but then basically take a teeny tiny fraction of that, and those might be the places where trans people feel friendly um, and safe, and that's a place where they can go. And so that's another service we provide, whereas we're constantly vetting places and asking people. And the second that someone says, I had a bad experience with this provider, they're off the list. That's how we ended up with two providers. But they're great. And so, so it, um, yeah. So I'm going so to move the conversation just a little bit. I wanted, I'm, uh, I've muted microphone, so give me a little wave if you need to come on, because uh, we're doing what we can to manage the feedback. Um, let's talk a little bit about who Leela Alcorn is because um, we've talked, I know we've introduced it a little bit, but there were actually, there's a bunch of social media and suicide specific factors to this case. There, so there's the overall part of discrimination and harm to people who are transgender for lots of reasons. It creates distal stress and proximal stress. And then in addition we have some some complex or some nuances that are related to the social media piece. If I get some of these things wrong for folks who know the events better than me, Please let me know. I've done my homework over the last couple of days, but I could certainly mess up. So what I understand is that Leela Alcorn, like many folks that I've worked with who are transgendered, um, participated in social media to find support, uh, and so was um, requesting support and community using social media quite a bit prior to her death, and then was even posting on Reddit's uh, the subreddit Our Suicide Watch, and I think that we're going to be hopefully talking with the moderator of that at some point this spring and was talking about her risk for suicide so there were sort of some points of awareness and intervention there were there were some suicide prevention items which is were risks of suicide disclosed to the family uh, it was the counselor who was uh, the counselor this conversion therapy th I'm sorry I know that this isn't going to be controversial but I find the conversion therapy stuff just abhorrent and it sort of turns my stomach and I understand that it's controversial and that people have different opinions, so you're going to see me cringe when I mention it. It's just going to happen. But, I mean, did they pay attention uh, when they were treating Leela about her risk for killing herself? Uh, we, we have a hard time for very mainstream standard mental health things, getting people to assess about suicide risk, talk about risk, do safety planning. Did that not get done? Then we have uh, her using um, social media to post several different targeted suicide notes that were sort of time released. We had the social media reaction to her death. I, her mother got doxxed, and I don't know if you guys know what doxing is, but basically using social media to stalk and harass people. So we use social media then to harass and, and mistreat her parents who behaved in ways that people are really bothered by. They just are. And I don't doubt that they love their child at all. But I also think that there's been such a public oh shaming of the parenting behavior that I think you can't you've got to at least sort of name that that's happening. And so they use social media to do that. And then there's we're using social media today to build wisdom or understanding or to get people to resources. Has anyone had any thoughts about how social media contributes to to how we look at this situation? Give me a wave down there because I think I've got y'all muted. No one? I'm putting you on, Des. I'm not stopping. Because I, you had a lot to say. Why did I know you were going to do this to me? Um, 
I don't really. Uh, I feel like my my thoughts on this are are as confused as anyone else's thoughts. Um, I feel like we have spent most of our time talking about the story in terms of. I almost feel like her death has been a vehicle for other things, whether that be bringing out the pitchforks for her parents and fundamental Christianity, and these these accusations of abuse like Dan Savage did. Or uh, using her death as a, a, a jumping point for Leela's Law. And I think that Leela's Law especially is something that we really, really need to, to pass. Um, but we're forgetting that somebody died here. And we're forgetting how important that is. And, and we're forgetting to think about how we can stop that and how we can prevent that. How we can talk about that productively. Um, and that has been really, really disappointing in in a lot of the same ways as it was with Robin Williams' death. Um, I'm going to also just sort of chime in, and then I'm going to check in with Bart for just a second, if I can make my clicking go. What's really troubling me, and I don't know how to put my finger on this, and I am entirely capable of making mistakes, so if I do, like, call me out on social media, tell me what you think of me. But um, there is this part where this was a preventable death. I mean, if you were in suicide prevention and looking at the facts of this case, there were a lot of points where there were prevention opportunities missed. And I don't, and, and, and so, and Dr. Tessa, you said something earlier this week that has stuck with me because I, I, I'm not sure what to do with these different things, but DBT training, so I'm just going to say maybe all conflicting things can be true, which is that we don't want to hyper-associate transgender and they're all suicidal. And at the same time, I don't want to ignore that, that Leela did not die from trans hate, it contributed but she died by suicide, which is preventable. And what do we do with that? Or how do we make sense of both of those things in a way that's really respectful? Because I don't want to say that it's inevitable that if, as long as there's hate, it's inevitable that people have to die. And at the same time, I don't want to create a conversation where people feel, because we were talking about the suicide aspect that we're doing, um, I think, Sabrina, you mentioned, I, I can't remember if it was you or someone else, about victim shaming, that we, by mentioning that this is a death by suicide that was preventable, I don't want to feel that anyone gets shamed. So I feel like by saying, well, here are all the pieces in front of me, I don't, I want to acknowledge them and see what you think as a panel. Wave your hand if you want to comment, or you can just leave me to the cricket. I'm going to put Bart on. So I, I think this is such a huge issue, and uh, you know, I saw a tweet the other day that just amazed me because it was so it was short, but it was so accurate, and it said, "Twitter, um, waiting for the next big thing to hate, right?" And <laughs> and 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 it, it really did it really did resonate with me because one of the things that I noticed with social media, even when I agree with folks, um, because people are more anonymous. Um, their their um, their ability to monitor or think about the consequences of the things that they're saying and doing are, are, are minimized that anonymity effect and the level of discourse and and the personal attacks and the level of rage and hate um, and the shaming and the blaming is is so incredible and I actually don't think Twitter's the way that we're going to resolve these big issues because I was just at a racism weekend um, where we, we did racial identity and, and white privilege and one of the things that really came out of that is that all folks who um, disagree with someone who's discriminating or being prejudiced against a group, we want to shame them and argue with them and fight with them. And that actually doesn't usually solve the problem. In fact, it tends to distance those folks. It tends to push them farther away. Um, and in, in, in fact, one of the ways that you need to, is to be an ally to folks that think differently to you than you and find a way to connect with them. Relationships are what changes people's um, opinions and mindset and changes their behavior. That doesn't mean that we should approve of the things that are going on, but we do need to have meaningful conversations where there isn't all this hate and energy. And I, and I think when you, when you see some of the stuff going on in social media, I think it really does. And I, Sean um, uh, stuck on social work really kind of, it can detract from some of the bigger issues we're trying to accomplish. And what we end up is we end up preaching to the choir um, on our side, and we end up pushing the people that we really need to convince farther away from us. And, and so those are things that social media is great about getting the word out, but I'm not sure it's great about solving the problem, if that makes any sense. Uh, Dr. Testa, I know that social media is not your thing, but I really, your comment was what has been rolling around in my head for two days. I was wondering if you wanted to say something. Sure. Um, yeah, it was interesting for me to hear your all reaction to this case because I think mine was somewhat different. Um, maybe because this is the work that I do on a daily basis, 
Um, this story was to be one that I've heard many times. Um, and it, it was interesting how this story was picked up in a little bit different way. And I think that we were having a discussion about how, um, why was the suicide piece of this story, um, from your perspective, kind of left out. And for me, it was almost a relief to not have that be the theme of, again, pairing transgender and suicide so closely. Um, you know, I always have a fear, even when we have these conversations about all of the um, challenges that transgender people face, and when we repeat this story about transgender and suicide, that are we um, essentially creating more minority stress for mm -hmm. youth and other transgender people um, who then are, go are just getting that message um, reinforced for them that my life is going to be really terrible and that the only way I could get a voice is to um, you know, complete suicide and have, have my statement broadcast to the world that way. Um, so in a way, I have been relieved to see the attention go more towards um, social justice, and I've been hopeful that perhaps that will, in the end, be one of the more effective ways we could reduce eventual suicidality um, is to change society. Um, that said, I, I absolutely agree that this was a preventable death, um, that this person did not die by, you know, directly by violence or victimization. Um, it was by suicide, and yet, you know, what are the, what were the determinants of that? What brought us there? I think if we can address those earlier issues in the flowchart that gets us to the end, then perhaps we are really getting at the crux of the issue. Uh, I was thinking about this. I'm going to the microphone again. I'm sorry. I'm trying to manage a lot of buttons, and I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, so I was thinking about this in a lot of ways, like a like a public health item. So thinking about somebody who dies in a car accident, and it's the drunk driver that hits them, and the not having the seatbelt, and then the ambulance is too late on the scene, and then the emergency room isn't prepared, or then there isn't good long-term health care for recovery. So it seems to me that when we're trying to prevent a death, that there are all these, in, these, all these interventions. And so when we're looking at this case, we're looking at Leela's case, um, we really do want to change society and, like, believe me, I want that. And I also want to figure out what to do when, when we see that somebody who is transgendered is posting increasingly on their social media networks that they're thinking of suicide, that we have some way to recognize that and respond, and that when someone has died by suicide, we think about perhaps not harassing their parents, who now are, by the way, all, the, all of Leela's family members are now increased risk of death by suicide. And, and we, we start to think through at all those different levels, what is the healthier choice? And then we do all of those things. So I don't feel like, I don't feel like we have to pick one focus and stick only with that. So I'm glad, I'm glad, I am deeply glad for the coverage of this. But then I think there was this really important Miss Window where Leela might still be alive and we wouldn't be, I mean, it might not have happened in the news that I would be having this conversation today, but also Leela would not be dead. What are, what are your thoughts about that? Because believe me, your comment, Dr. Tess, has been sticking with me. Well, I actually, I do like that analogy that you just, I, I really like that analogy of, you know, all of the steps. And yeah, there are then multiple points where we could break the chain that leads to the end. And, and I absolutely agree that we should be looking at all of those individual points. And it is disturbing that in this case there were such clear indications and that I mean, I don't, it's hard for me to comment actually on the specifics of the case because I feel like I don't actually know. You know, I, I know what I hear in the media, um, but it, it seems like there would have been many opportunities to intervene. Um, and I guess what, what I would like to offer um, as a piece of this conversation then is like, what would we do if we were to see a trans youth or a trans adult um, 
yeah, at risk for suicide. And you know, I think for the most part, what you should be doing is the same that you would do for any other individual, um, assessing risk in the same way, intervening in the same way. Um, but if I could go back to some of the research that I was talking about before, what I didn't add was the aspects of resilience that are community specific. And these, I think, can be really important factors that we can use in, in those moments to hopefully um, support somebody who is going through challenges. And these aspects of resilience that have been identified so far have been a uh, connection to your community and to develop some sort of pride in your identity. Um, so I think this is an area where social media has an immense amount of potential. And you do see that transgender people, a lot of the time, do turn to social support online um, because they may not be getting it elsewhere. Um, so I think that's been very powerful for many um, transgender people that I've known to be able to connect with people who are like themselves online. Um, but you know, as a clinician or as a family member or friend, if you can help somebody to understand that they're not alone, that they do belong, like the models tell us, is an important factor um, to some sort of community. I think that that can be very powerful. Um, in the resource list that I had given you guys, there are some books that I had recommended. There's some conferences that I recommended um, and some websites. And I think all Could of those. Could you list a couple briefly? Like if someone checks out three things, what should they do? And if they only look at one thing, what should they do? Could you do that? Well, I think the ideally, if people can find others who are face to face with them, that's most wonderful, right? And so I would encourage people to know the resources in their own communities. Um, but beyond that, I think that even reading a book can be very powerful. Two books that I would highly recommend um, is Transgender Warriors uh, by Leslie Feinberg and also The Lives of Transgender People by Beeman and Rankin. Um, and both of those books made a huge impact on me, um, and both as a clinician and as a transgender person. So I think anyone can read those books. Um, in terms of websites, well, one thing that's really cool is the Trevor, the Trevor Project has a social media forum called Trevor Space. Um, I I haven't like been on that myself and I don't have any clients who've been on it, but it sounds like a really unique um, avenue for people to potentially generate that social support for themselves. Um, and then two conferences that I really have, have enjoyed um, and highly recommend are Gender Spectrum and um, the Trans Health Conference in Philadelphia. Um, but there's there's so many resources out there actually that it's almost like I don't know where to begin. Um, so it's not that there's a lack of resources; it's that maybe we're not aware of them. Um, so if if the resource list that I provided could be helpful, great. I think people are also very savvy to search for themselves these days. Um, but you know, if there's a sense that oh, there's nothing out there, maybe they won't bother doing that. So just keep your eyes open. And I think you will find something for yourself. You know, the other thing that I'll point out is, in terms of community connection and pride, um, there are different groups within the transgender community, and so not everybody may feel the same sense of acceptance um, by one group that they attend or one book that they read. Um, and so I think social media is also really important for that purpose because you know people of color may not feel like the overall umbrella transgender community is really uh, one where they fit um, and thankfully there are people of color transgender communities who have a you know a, a powerful um, support network for themselves um, or dividing down the lines of um, gender queer versus trans men versus um, two-spirit. There's all sorts of identities that people um, may need to find other people who really feel like their community. Um, and now that I hear myself speak on that, I have to say one more thing, um, that 
sometimes we get the most powerful social support from people who are not like ourselves. Um, and so just because you don't identify in the same way, I don't think that takes away just how important you can be to a person um, in terms of providing social support. Okay, I think that's what I have to say. So I'm going to switch and ask Sabrina a really similar question, which is we're talking about resource and about chances to prevent death at multiple points in the stream and ways that we can connect folks with their community and with resources that help them be resilient. What would you recommend, Sabrina? Well, um, what do they say? 90% of life is showing up. You have to show up for people and, and be present with them and realize that uh, if you're going to look for... Um, if you want to do outreach to the trans community, you have to go where they are. And you have to learn all those nuances. You know, like, I was sitting here nodding my head off, trying not to be a bobblehead, but um, we, you know, we, and the one thing that is very unique about New Mexico is we are, um, whites are the minority. The majority are people of color. And so we've had that opportunity where the majority of the people who come in to see us are people of color. And and really we've gotten the full spectrum of uh, what that's, what people are experiencing when they're going back to their communities. Uh, social media is huge. It's, that is, uh, you know, I, I finally went to the directors and they said, is it, is it kosher if I, you know, add, start adding people on Facebook because I'm doing more interventions at night when people are saying, like, or I'm having a hard time because our center closes at 6 p.m and they know, um, and I can't always respond and we've talked about that and how that that might work but when I do, you know, when I show up, I show up for them and they're not, you know, be kind, be compassionate, treat, I think the comment was treat the people exactly, the trans person who's suicidal exactly how you treat any other person who is suicidal um, but don't forget that there is something unique about them and the, you know, my my concern, and this is sort of the, this is where I was coming from. It was so weird to hear, you know, when Desiree was talking about how the fact that she hadn't heard any coverage and there really wasn't anything, and I thought, really, because I'm being bombarded with it, <laughs> because that's what I follow, right? Our social media is a reflection of the things that we choose to follow, <laughs> and and so I had already seen all of it. We'd already, you know, I had gone into the center to take a deep breath and we'd unpacked that as a group and talked about suicide risk and I had to watch myself because my 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 thing that I've noticed in, in you know, in the suicide prevention field, we want to, we want those moments. We want to know. We want to boil it down to what do we already know. That's how we lose people because if you can't understand what some of those unique factors are, or those intersections of risk happen in the trans community. If you don't show up, as soon as you show up and say, well, you know, your risk is a lot like everybody else's, then you're asked kindly to go. <laughs> or you're put in your place and given very specific directions. I've seen it happen. And, you know, we don't, it's where social justice lives and we can, you know, we've had to break up angry social justice arguments because people are trying to say you just don't understand. So it's the same thing that you would do any other way. Figure out where people are and how you find them when they're most vulnerable. Make sure they have resources that they feel comfortable really trying to, to access. So one thing that I said offline to April that um, that is going to be unpopular, but I'm going to say it anyway because people need to know, is that the minute that you blow it with a trans person, with your service, they, you might not get anybody back ever again. Not only we not get that person back, but they're going to go tell other people. So, perfect example, I was talking with someone um, who had been turned away from multiple services, so locally, but also had called the Trevor line and had a negative experience with that particular operator that they were speaking with, and now we'll never call them back. And in no way do I want to say, you know, don't call there and they can't handle it, but it's it's important for anybody. It's a teachable moment right there. If you're providing services, um, you, LGBT, we throw it together all the time, but as I've been told uh, just about every day that I've ever gone to the center, there's LGB and then there's T. And we are not the same communities. There's an overlap. But just because the Trevor Project is great at working with LGB youth doesn't mean that they won't blow it with a trans person who calls and start asking them, in this case it was asking them intrusive questions about their transition, which is not appropriate. 
if you would not ask of if I would not ask April about her genitals, then I will not ask anybody else on the panel. Now, it's Sabrina, not don't okay. go putting up walls between us. <laughs> if you want to tell me about them, that's your business. <laughs> oh, this is how I always uh, could go wrong. We are getting well, a lot this of questions. Is, uh, but this, these are the conversations that happen where people will want to volunteer the information. Don't freak out. But don't ask. If you wouldn't ask anybody else, so, not, so it's, it's employing that common sense because I, I always liken it to like pregnant women. We A lot of times as a society view pregnant women as community property and they're always complaining about being touched inappropriately. Well trans people are treated like that a lot in that they, they're, it's like, oh you're trans? Well have you had surgery? Have you, are you going to, whoa, I don't it, know you. That's it, it, yeah, I get to little. Now we're getting a lot of questions and I want to actually speak to this because I'm not sure who knows the answer to this question and I don't know if I know or not but I feel like I may be able to help. We're getting questions about social media and suicide risk and I'm going to tell you that what we know for the general community or what we think we know is that in social media communities much like your other networks if the more suicide uh, attempt and suicide, deaths by suicide you have in a network the greater everybody connected to that network their, their risk for death might be and so um, one of the things that you know we talk about is that you know we in the case of Leela she was really talking about her suicide online a lot and and we Ning Yu has uh, been researching this and she was one of our guests she's a data scientist from last year and talking about are there communities that are being more protective and sort of spreading or networking resilience and are there social media communities for folks who are transgendered who might be uh, spreading risk because of because depression and risk and suicidal thoughts and feelings and behaviors uh, there there may or may not be a contagion factor and if if somebody comes on and is offering help and support so I'm not saying don't talk about those things but if the community tends to offer help and support around that and resilience around that may be one thing but if the community is encouraging of escalating self harm it, it may it may be worse. Additionally, it could be that isolation from social media may escalate your risk, but being able to participate in groups that are supportive is useful. Uh, I'm going to tell you, and I am not an expert, and I don't want anyone to think that I am. I was simply the only licensed psychologist in the four sickest and poorest counties of rural Kansas. And so the folks who were transgendered were my patients because I was it, like in terms of any kind of training or experience or the ability to network into it and we did a lot of finding resources and we did a lot of using social media to get to experts so when Dr. Testa talks about access to primary care being really particularly difficult like do that in the middle of nowhere it's like super hard to get a primary care doctor who is familiar with your hormone replacement therapy and your uh, comorbid psychotic disorder and your other you know your diabetes and, and, like and who can really treat you and treat you effectively and then the pharmacy who will fill your medication without subverting your medication uh, and then dealing with dealing with how the legal system may treat you I, I mean I don't want to disclose but I saw things that changed my experience of wanting to be an advocate not that I am special but it was like oh I'm witnessing this happen it didn't happen to me but it, it was to my patients and so what we would do is we would find communities of support that is not easy if you don't know how to search for it or you don't know how to look for it and and I would tell you that not all of my patients who were transgender wanted to be parts of the same community so we were finding extremely specific niches of, of categories of exceptionality Whew. but I think for every single one of them that found support they began to be much more stable the urge to die would go down uh, with you have better health care you have better resources when other parts when you are being treated well by uh, the, your social infrastructure so you and there were all sorts of ways we went about that but we use technology and media to make that happen so I'm going to tell you that social media is a tool that can amplify efforts to harm people to dox them to harass them to discriminate against them and it also can be leveraged to find resources in places where that is extremely hard to do uh, I was in rural Kansas is not San Francisco and I'm a little jealous of you, Dr. Testa uh, 
<laughs> I'm going to also, the bowl of interesting questions, and I had promised we'd do a little bit of this, and, and the, bowl, the bowl has been whispered to me, and I can't draw the question out, but I do have a question I wanted to go through as we're getting ready to close out. Um, we're, the, the bowl is being a little bit more uh, serious and subdued tonight, but the question I wanted to ask everybody to talk about just personally, and this is sort of we're going to get real here, getting real, um, is when you feel isolated and when you feel judged, members of our panel, uh, how do you get through it? Because I, 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 just a suspicion, but I don't think there's anybody on this panel that hasn't been in the margin. It's just a guess. And so who'd like to wave your hand? Who wants to jump in on that? I'm going to start picking people. I'm clicking. I'm going with Bart. <laughs> Okay. Well, now, now I, I, I feel like I've been, been rejected. Um, <laughs> so, and targeted. That's a word I learned over the weekend, targeting. So one of the things is, one of the things that's been really powerful for me recently is I recognize that um, a lot of the struggles that I've had in, in my life um, is, is wanting the approval and the acceptance of other people and being very, very um, dependent on um, external validation. Um, and I think that's very natural. I think that that's how a lot of us are wired. I think some of us are less so, some more so. I tend to be more so. And so one of the things that happens for me is when I don't get the um, validation that, or acceptance that I'm looking for, I get really hurt. And, and I get depressed with that. And, and, and I go into this, this kind of cycle. Um, and one of the things I'm starting to notice is that, I, um, that those feelings, and you, you taught me this, April, feelings are facts. And, and, and really accepting the fact that sometimes I'm not going to feel great for a little bit um, and, and not giving myself grief about, um, about not feeling good. And, and being able to, to, to feel kind of crappy and be okay with that, knowing that typically it passes, and it actually passes quicker when I'm able to kind of embrace the negative feelings and, and kind of recognize, yeah, I do feel bad about this, and anybody would feel bad if this happened to them, um, and, and that, that seems to help me, and, and being able to, being comfortable with negative emotions has been a, a, a something that I've been working on, so, um, and, and also for me, to be honest, a distraction, and, and being physical, um, if I'm in, if I'm sedentary, um, um, and things are really bothering me, it's really bad, but if I can get active and get moving, um, that tends to be a good distraction for me. So those, those two things tend to help me quite a bit. Good advice. How about you, Desiree? Oh, sorry, I didn't click. Let me undo your thing, your microphone. Go ahead and say it again. <laughs> I think when I feel judged um, or, or marginalized in some way, I, as a, a you know, Half of my life later, not not as an adolescent, um, I think that I tend to go a little more inward, um, and I get quiet. And I'm very active on social media and in my my social life in general. But that's when I'll go quiet, and people will be like, "Hey, are you okay? What are you doing?" Um, and I will, you know, I'll get quiet. But I'm I'm there in the background. I'm I'm writing things in my journal. I've I've been a very active journaler since I was about. 16 years old um, and I talk to my partner and I'm like what is this about and I try to really unpack it and figure it out and and kind of know what's going on um, but I will to the world I will I'll kind of shut down and and my mom knows like if she sees me shut up on Facebook she's like hey what are you doing what are you doing what's going on <laughs> so, so that's how I work it out how about you Dr. Testa Oh, I did a bad thing with your microphone, too. So sorry. I got, got charmed by everybody, and I forgot. Go ahead. That's okay. Gave me an extra second to uh, to think about it. Um, well, actually, I mean, I think my my response is going to be very similar to, to Bart's. Um, I think a, a large part of what has kept me going over the years is understanding my emotions as things that will pass and sort of embracing negative emotions, seeing that there's some value in negative emotions. Um, and that wasn't always something that I had thought about. Um, so, you know, my adolescence was not easy, an easy one either. Um, and I wish I had understood that then. Um, it took me years to get there. but. But yeah, this practice of, of sort of understanding even negative emotions as useful emotions helps me kind of just stay with them for the moment, and then they do pass easier than when you struggle with them. Um, but the other 
piece, the less sort of lofty piece, is just trying to piece together as many coping skills, whatever they are, as I possibly can. I had a friend who used to brush her teeth, and that would make her feel better if she was stressed out, and like, right on, do that. Um, for me, it's getting outside in nature as much as possible. I used to have a pet bird that I would turn to a lot. Um, it's I journal, yeah, sometimes I meditate. Um, that's kind of a new thing. I'm really trying with the meditation. Um, anything, distraction, playing a game if I just have to get through the moment. So I think it's just you have to gather, like we would say in psychology, a whole toolbox of as many coping skills as you can and um, just use whatever you need to to get through the moments. Uh, excellent. Uh, excellent. Sabrina. Well, um, all the good ideas are taken, so I have to make <laughs> something up. Now, uh, actually, and you know, it depends. It's interesting. Social media, I I will hide in certain places, but I have a non non professional, non grown up Twitter, um, and where I go to be cynical and say all the things, or find all the people who are saying all the things that I am feeling, um, because it's interesting. You know, other people are trying to process too, and that's. Um, you know, and, and again, that a negative emotion is telling you something and trying to figure out what that is. And when I'm done self-analyzing, uh, I may go watch TV. Um, or I'm just, you know, I tend to maybe work a little too much because it, there's nothing better for me to pull me out of my own head than to uh, sit with somebody else who, who really needs me to be present and to not be um, having a pity party. <laughs> And I'm going to close this up because we're in that last minute. So I'm going to let you know, there. Um, somebody made a comment that I really want to share on social media, and I apologize, I haven't got the right attribution, so please make sure you say, that was me. But they talked about how social media allowed, when Leela died, for her message and, and for the message of this marginalized community to come out. That because social media is inherently democratic, and because everybody can have a platform, uh, one of the things that social media has done for the transgender community is that they don't rely on the mainstream media for a platform anymore, and that's really great. Uh, when I first started on Twitter, uh, especially for, uh, for me to be able to advocate better for the folks I was serving who were transgendered, like, I immediately started following feeds of uh, trans advocacy communities, and social media has allowed for a spread and for a message that it would not have allowed for in the past. And, I mean, this is why I like this. We get to have a suicide conversation every week. And look how I didn't swear. I've been trying to swear less. I don't know. We're, we're working on it. Uh, I may ditch this. It may, this resolution may be out the window. Uh, I'm going to close this out on, on, on uh, sort of like my coping strategy. Like I, like, I don't think there's probably very few people, I think, who are attracted to this field and to this chat had, had an easy moment in life where they're like, this is pretty easy. I'm like everybody else, and I got this figured out. Like, I think most of us. And, and I, I'm certainly there with all of you. And so I think there was a moment when I was an adolescent where I realized that I was not, because I think there was a period where I thought, I don't know if I'm going to live as long. I, like, I, I think I was sort of was thinking, maybe I'm not going to make it. And, um, and I said, you know, no, I'm going to live a long time. And there's a future me. And this future me has kicked this problem's ass. And if they could reach back in time, they would tell me, to be patient and wait for me to kick the ass of this problem. I'm not going to be around the situation where I'm going to be judged or isolated forever. It's going to be a long time. There were periods where it was quite a long time. Um, but I was going, there was me, and it was in the future. There was a timeline, and I was going to get there, and I was going to be past this, and it was going to happen. And, uh, like, there were days, there were more than days, where I really believed um, that that was going to take me a long time to get there, like that wasn't going to come tomorrow, that I was really going to be stuck. But uh, and I, I think it was that sort of inherent faith that everything is temporary, everything, including me, is temporary, that has allowed me to make it through bad people and bad problems and bad parts of my life. And I'm really, really grateful for that bit of wisdom that has taken me a long place. Uh, and Sam Nads, do you want to know what I also do to cope? You know that this is this is nail polish. I have to tell you, uh, all my patients know this, all my friends know this, Des knows this. Like I'm just like it's two hours. My nails are wet. I can't help you. I'm just gotta sit here. 
constitution. <laughs> uh, uh, and I found silly things to cope, and I found big things. Uh, and sometimes what I do to cope is that I try to make a difference. And so sometimes, sometimes what I do to make to remind myself that there's something beyond this problem is we do this, and we do it every week. Uh, I am super grateful. I want everybody to like give a chance. Okay, so if they had a one final thought or a take home message, I want to give everybody a chance to chime in. We're a couple minutes late. If we didn't get to your question or you, if we didn't get to you, that is okay. We can get to you all week. Like you can keep tweeting about this all week. And so I want you, I want you to do that because uh, I, I, the, the flood was huge this week. It just was. So let's keep talking about this. If there are aspects to this that we want to talk about more, then we'll just schedule another chat. You'll send me your topic, you'll send me a lineup, and we'll get it done. That's just how we're going to do it. So everybody, it's time for final thoughts. I'm going to uh, go. I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to start with Sabrina and work my way to Bart down That's at the bottom of the screen. Horribly unfair. I <laughs> gotcha. On account of I have no idea what to say, um, so I will just go back to something that I already said. Um, just show up for people. Compassion is free. Being kind is free. And that's the thing that has brought me to my knees this week is I've had two people pull me aside and, and in different ways say, no one's ever been this kind to me. I don't understand. Wow. And then I start to cry. And yeah, see, we'll make April cry. We'll make everybody You're cry. Not, I'm not so, crying. Yes, you are. I like compassion um, is free. Kindness is cheap and compassion is free. I like that a lot. Kindness is absolutely free. Show up for people and be kind because it doesn't cost you anything. And Dr. Testa, Rye. Oh, I did it again with the microphone and I wasted your wisdom. Go for it. <laughs> um, actually, yeah, I'm glad for the last comment. I just tweeted out that um, in terms of coping skills and stuff. There was another book I really wanted to recommend. It's by a trans author, Kate Bornstein, who's amazing. Um, and it's called Hello Cruel World, 101 Alternatives to Suicide for Teens, Freaks, and Other Outlaws. Um, so that's a great book. Um, I guess there were two quick... I'm going to try to say these two things quickly. We may need to follow up because they're not really quick things. but. Um, in terms of if there's any primary care doctors out there or psychologists, I wanted to say that the message I've been getting from, from doctors who do serve this population is that, yes, you do need some specialized knowledge, but it's not rocket science. You can provide these services for people. Um, even if you don't have the experience, there's guides out there and you can consult so please make yourselves available to do that because people need um, services where they are. Um, and then the final thing that I realized I forgot to comment on was there's a whole history between the trans community and mental and medical health providers, right? We have been diagnosing transgenderism in medical and mental health communities and we've also been gatekeepers to people getting medical care. And so if there's some level of distrust when they walk in the door with you, there are reasons why. Um, and so we need to just understand that so that we can have discussions about it if need be and overcome that level of distrust so that we can provide the services that the community needs. So those are my final thoughts. Thank you. Woot, woot. Uh, and I'm there with you. Like, if you don't know, consult, because there may be nobody else. If you just be willing. Absolutely. Yeah. Desiree, let me unmic you. Oh, ah. <laughs> um, I guess my final thought is that what I've what I've really noticed and what's really troubled me with this um, whole story is that it's been very polarizing, and I have struggled with that because usually I'm on the you know the extreme left, being a dirty, smelly liberal all the time, forever, um, <laughs> and I find myself in the middle here, being like. What are you guys doing? Come on, chill out. Like, we need an adult. I'm the adult. That's really weird. I don't like that. Um, I don't want to be the adult, but, <laughs> like, we... I, I just feel like what we got, what we really need to come that, back to in terms of the story is love. And in terms of, like, all of these stories, really, we just need to go back to love, and we need to remember that 
everybody who is in this place is a human and we need to find a way to love them regardless of whether we disagree with them agree with them I don't care find a way because we are all worth it we're all stuck here together and the great Bart so I want to I want to I want to thank our, our, our presenters I, I learned so much I mean there's so much when I think about working with my staff, because we do get a lot of, of calls from folks um, that are transgendered, I think we do an okay job, but I think sometimes we don't. And, and I, I want to know more about what I can do to coach my staff. Um, but as everybody was talking, something that really hits me is, and I'm really angry about this, I think we spend so much of our time in suicide prevention and in mental health focused on what is wrong with the person. And, and I, I want to take a step back and say, you know what, maybe it isn't what's wrong with the person. Maybe what, it's what's flipping wrong with the people around the person and the world of the, that the person is in. Um, I, I think that one of the things that really, really hits me is that everything so focused on the individual. All of these things we're talking about occur in a social context, and they're, they're in response to a social context. Is that person in a healing and supportive social context, or is the world crapping all over them? And we put this all on the person, right? And in fact, if you look at psychologists and psychiatrists and the medical model, it's all focused on what's wrong with this person, how do we fix it? And I say we need to take a step back and figure out what's wrong with the world, what's wrong with people in the social context, and what can we do to make a kinder, more compassionate, supportive world? Because um, I think that would actually have a much bigger impact than a lot of the crap that's getting passed around as uh, medicine these days. This is excellent. We're over. I usually try to stick us to the minute, but this is just, this is a big conversation. Uh, thank you to all of our panel. Thanks to uh, at Fought for Hope, Sam Nads. Thanks to Twirl and Swirl. Thanks to Atos. Thanks to Ursula Whiteside. There was a huge list. Thanks to Tony Wood, uh, who makes this possible every week uh, in the background. You've, the things he does, you've no idea. Um, there's a lot of questions we couldn't get to. Um, we'll, we'll get to them, and if we miss things, let me know. Uh, everybody have a wonderful evening. Take care. Bye.